I, wa I want to thank uh, both Suburban and the Genome Institute for inviting me, and thank you for the introduction. Actually, in, in the work that I'm going to talk about today, I'll probably speak, I'm really not going to talk about any of the work we do in the lab, but really give an overview of how genomics and genetics are, uh, have and are currently impacting uh, the treatment uh, and diagnosis of breast cancer and how this is likely to be expanded in the near future. So to, to begin this lecture, what I'd like to do is, for the purposes of my talk, define what I mean by genomic medicine. And uh, simply what I mean is the use of molecular genotype, which usually means the sequence of the DNA, the sequence of the genes, and the molecular phenotype, which is the expression either measured by messenger RNA or by protein expression, to predict disease incidence, outcome, and or dictate treatment. Now in cancer bi biology, there are two genomes, and it's important to keep this in mind. One is the tumor genome, which is referred to as a somatic genome, and the other is the patient genome, or the germline. And last month you heard from Larry Brody about germline mutations in genes like BRCA1 and BRCA2 that predispose, uh, to the, the predispose patients to uh, uh, getting breast cancer. Um, today most of my talk is going to focus on using the tumor genome to dictate uh, decisions about management of patients although I will touch on germline mutations as well later on in the talk. Now, in the past, treatment was based on clinical features of breast cancer, and this is true for pretty much all tumors, that is, uh, features such as size, pathologic grade, uh, the spread to the regional lymph nodes. But also in the past, um, it, it, it involved expression or genetic abnormalities, so genomic features of the tumor, um, but of only a few genes in the tumor. Now, this is not a new story, and in fact, the, really the story begins with this publication, which I would say is the first therapy based on tumor phenotype, its measurement or its affecting the estrogen receptor, which of course is still used today in the management of breast cancer, is a really important feature of the management of breast cancer. But this paper by uh, George Beetson was published in The Lancet in 1896 about a novel treatment for patients with inoperable breast cancer. So this is the only case history I'll describe today, but the patient he saw was a young woman, 33, premenopausal, who several months earlier had presented with a very large locally advanced tumor. It was 11 by 8 centimeters, there was clear skin involvement, and she underwent a mastectomy. Three months later when he saw her, she had diffuse chest wall involvement, she had ulceration of her skin involvement of uh, lymph nodes, and apparent metastatic disease in her thyroid. So this patient at this point was unresectable, and at the time in the 1890s, there was no other treatment for this patient. But what he did is he removed her ovaries and, uh, a month later, and over the next couple of months, she developed a complete remission in her breast cancer and actually survived for four years before dying from breast cancer. So why did, why did Beetson do this? Well, what he, what he was known at the time from both animal studies that he and others had done was that the ovaries somehow controlled the growth and differentiation of the breast. What was also had been observed but never really acted on was that patients who had breast cancer and then went through menopause sometimes had spontaneous remissions of their breast cancer. So his reasoning was, well, gee, maybe inducing menopause will cause a remission in this patient. And, and of course, uh, we, we now know that, that that's absolutely correct. So why does this work? This works because of the tumor phenotype. Breast cancers in about two-thirds of all cases express a protein known as estrogen receptor, which sits in the cytosol of cells as an inactive protein until estrogen comes along and, and binds to the receptor, and that creates an active complex, which one of its primary functions is to go into the nucleus and act as a transcription factor where it regulates the expression of other genes, and these genes drive the growth and proliferation of cells. So what Beetson did, of course, was remove the estrogen, so it turned the system off. And, and of course, therapies we use today are designed at either removing the sources of estrogen in patients or interfering directly with the function of the estrogen receptor. But so this is molecular medicine in a very real sense. It's targeting the tumor phenotype. Now Beetson, of course, didn't know any of this, and it took about 70 or 80 years to work out these pathways in the time after he did the experiment. But it works because of the molecular phenotype and manipulation of that phenotype. This, the first therapy based on ge tumor genotype is also not a new story. This is a, a therapy that began about in the 1980s when Dennis Slayman and his group identified amplification of a gene known as HER2-NU. 
So this is just one piece of data from their paper, but it also shows what it is old style genomics and low throughput genomics. These are southern blots. These are blots where DNA is run on a, f uh, run on a gel and transferred to a filter paper. And then a probe is used that identifies a specific target, in this case, the gene known as HER2 nu. Now, in every cell in a normal, in a normal individual, there should be two copies of any, any normal gene. And so all of these should look identical from normal cells. And you can immediately see that these are 70 or so tumors, and there's tremendous variation in the intensity of the signal, meaning the copy number of genes in these tumors varies, which of course is not normal. And you can see, for example, in tumor number 18, there's a tremendously increased amount of signal. This signal in uh, lane 3 represents a normal diploid cell. So what you can see is there's tremendous variation, and in about a third of the cases, he found what was defined as genomic amplification, increased copy numbers of the genes. He also found another striking feature. When he looked at the prognosis of patients, the patients with gene amplification, especially high levels of amplification, did worse than those patients who, who had normal copy number of HER2. And this has been confirmed in, in I think, more than 100 studies in the time since that. Now what's HER2? HER2 is a protein. It's shown in red here. It sits in the membrane of cells. It's a growth factor receptor. And when it's activated, it becomes an active tyrosine kinase. It phosphorylates other proteins. And as I'll show you in a minute, that activates pathways important to the growth and survival of cells. It's a member of the epidermal growth factor receptor family, which has four members, EGF receptor HER3 and HER4, and a whole host of ligands which bind to these proteins. HER2 works as a partner with the other members of the family. So shown in red, you can see it will uh, dimerize with either EGF receptor HER3 or HER4. And in response to ligands, it turns on pathways that are important for growth or survival of cells. And it leads to a whole bunch of outcomes that make sense when you think about this as a bad prognostic feature. It causes proliferation, it protects cells from cell death, causes invasion, migration, um, it affects angiogenesis. So all of these features make sense that, it, that it's, in fact, a bad prognostic feature. More importantly, because of this, it's also become a very important target. In the, roughly 15 to 20 percent of patients who have amplification of this protein, we can interfere with the function of this protein either with antibodies like trastuzumab or pertuzumab, which bind to the outside of, of the cell and, and block the function of the protein here, or small molecule inhibitors uh, such as lipatinib, which will bind to the protein and inhibit the kinase activity. So in a very real sense, genomic medicine that's been going on now for quite some, some number of years. But both of these examples are examples of looking at one gene at a time in, in the patient's tumor. Um, and that's really not where we are today. We still use clinical features. We still use the individual genes, estrogen and progesterone receptor and HER2 new amplification as measures of prognosis and also measures of um, what would be the most effective treatments for the patient. But we've also started to incorporate more global genomic um, measures in, in, uh, of, of tumor prognosis and, and predictive uh, measures of therapies for the treatment of cancers. And I'm going to talk about two today in, in a little bit of detail, the recurrence score and gene expression microarrays. So let's start with the recurrence score. This was developed to stratify the risk and relapse and the need for chemotherapy in early stage patients who are hormone receptor positive, node negative, and could be treated with hormonal agents such as tamoxifen. So why, did, why were people interested in doing this in this group? Well, we know this is a group of patients who, by and large, do well, but some of them relapse. And yet, over the course of the, say, the 90s and the early part of this, uh, this uh, century, we started using more and more chemotherapy so that we are treating a larger fraction of these patients who otherwise do well with chemotherapy in spite of the fact that only few of them really needed treatment. So the question was, could you stratify the risk of relapse and identify the patients who are more likely to benefit from chemotherapy with some sort of test based on their genome? What they did is they developed a 21 gene set assay by starting by culling the literature and microarray experiments, and I'll define what a microarray is later. And then they designed a quantitative reverse transcription PCR assay from formal and fixed paraffin embedded tumor tissue. So first, as an aside, I want to explain what I mean by quantitative reverse transcription PCR, because I think you'll hear about this more and more in the lectures and, um, and probably as well in, um, in, in the literature. So, so this is an assay that starts with RNA, in this case from a tumor sample on a slide. 
and uses an enzyme known as reverse transcriptase to turn that RNA into a copy of the RNA known as cDNA, or co it's a DNA a copy of the RNA. In the next step of this assay, you combine a complementary piece of DNA shown in green to the, to the DNA that you've just copied, and that probe has uh, two molecules attached to it. One is a fluorescent molecule shown as a reporter in R, and the second is a molecule that quenches the fluorescence. So this, at, this probe is actually silent at this point. But then you do polymerase chain reaction where you copy the DNA into multiple copies. And what happens in the course of that reaction is the, the DNA in this green probe gets degraded, and that frees up the reporter uh, molecule from the quenching molecule, and it becomes fluorescent. And this can be measured in a fluorometer. As you repeat rounds of PCR, you get more and more freed reporter, and the amount of this reporter is proportional to how much st starting material you have, and so you can measure this actually continuously as you're doing these assays. So another term you'll often see is real-time PCR, but that's synonymous with quantitative, and you have quantitative reverse transcription PCR because you're starting with RNA. So this is a very uh, effective way of measuring the amount of a protein. So what did they do? They measured um, from the literature search and array experiments they did, they found 21 genes that were useful um, in this assay, and these are just a list of the genes. Some of them are, are related to estrogen receptor, the estrogen receptor and progesterone receptor, and some other targets. These are actually good prognostic features. HER2 and a related gene that's amplified with for HER2F, often GRAB7. A number of genes known to predict high proliferation rates in tumors genes that are known to be involved in invasion, some other genes which uh, um, can't easily be categorized in, the, in these categories, and then a number of reference genes just as no internal normalizations. And what they do is they perform this assay on all of these genes, normalize them to the standards, and then they, they have an equation that accounts for all of these genes and results in a score. Some of them are uh, give you negative values, so these are good prognostic features and they lower the score, these are bad prognostic features and they raise the score, as are these and these. And so what they wind up with is a linear, uh, not a linear, but a continuous predictor of recurrence. So this is a study where the, one of the features of the study that was so powerful is they designed this to use qPCR in formal and fixed paraffin embedded tissue, which means they can immediately go back to large studies that had been done over the last 20 or 30 years, take samples from that. Um, and apply this test to, the, to that, those samples and validate whether their predictor is, is a true measure of recurrence. And so this is just the recurrence rate. This is the recurrence score. And you can see in blue that the higher the recurrence score, the, the higher the likelihood of recurrences. And this is from a, um, a randomized study that was done by NSABP in about 19, in, in the early 90s. Now, what they did is they then sort of grouped it. They just binned this data into three groups, what they'll call a low-risk group, an intermediate, and a high-risk group. And when you do that, what you see is it predicts prognosis. So this is, again, going back to a study that had looked at patients treated with tamoxifen. Um, actually, the study asked, does tamoxifen decrease the rate of recurrence? And that study, uh, which is a multi-center study, showed, in fact, that tamoxifen was beneficial in early-stage node-negative hormone receptor positive patients. So when they looked at the patients who had received tamoxifen, what they found is those patients that they called low risk with a low recurrence score, less than 17, less than or equal to 17, they had a very good outcome. There were patients, though, who had a score above 31 that had a, a, a worse outcome, a higher likelihood of relapse, and, and a group in between. And these are the numbers down here. So about half of the patients in this group that we normally would say these are good this is a good prognostic group. Half of them, in fact, have a very low risk at 10 years of recurring, only, only 6 or 7 percent if treated with hormonal therapy. On the other hand, about a quarter of them have a fairly high risk. One in three of those patients will recur. So this data becomes very useful for saying, okay, these patients um, may not need more therapy, and we'll come back to that in a minute, whereas these patients do. Now, this, this allows us to stratify risk beyond what would normally be, be done in the clinic. So again, just to show you two parameters, it's, it's well known that small tumors tend to do better than large tumors when you look at as a, as a clinical staging of patients. But when you look, and, and that's borne out by this test, so if you look at the patients who do well, have a low risk, it's higher in the smaller tumors than it is in the larger tumors. But what's clear is there are small tumors who have a high recurrence score and there are large tumors with a low recurrence score. 
And that's also been known that while in general size predicts the likelihood of recurrence, it's not a perfect predictor. So this allows us to stratify risk further than the clinical parameter. As another example, grade is, a, again, a, a well-used parameter that predicts recurrence. And high-grade tumors um, are more likely to recur than low-grade tumors. But again, within each grade of the tumor, there are, most of the low-risk tumors, in fact, have a low recurrence score, but some of them have a high, higher recurrence score. And similarly, most are of the, or the uh, plurality of, of the high, of the poorly differentiated tumors have a high recurrence score, but still there's a significant number that have a low recurrence score. So this allows us to look at patients and start to stratify their risk further than the clinical parameters. On the other hand, if we look at HER2 new amplification, the single gene that was, has been established now for more than 30 years, um, what we find here is that virtually all of the patients have a high recurrence score. So in fact, if you have HER2 amplification, you probably don't need to do a recurrence score because you already know that it's going to be high. And, and this is out of the same set of data. So you can see, again, about half of the patients overall have a low risk, a quarter have an intermediate risk, and a quarter have a high risk. But when you look at HER2, they're all biased towards the high risk. So in some cases, a single gene may give you as much information as the recurrence score. But in the other cases, um, we learn a lot about who may need more therapy. Now, this has also been applied to, no, although it was developed for node-negative tumors, which are the, the patients who um, we clearly are over-treating, it's also true for uh, node-positive tumors. So this is just showing study where they looked at recurrence score in node-negative and node-positive tumors. And what you can see, again, in all cases, node-negative, one to three uh, lymph nodes or, or four positive lymph nodes, that the patients, there's a, there's a lymph uh, uh, a continuous relationship between recurrence score and the likelihood of relapse. What you can also see, though, is that at every score, the node-positive patients are at a higher risk of recurring, so that when you stratify the patients, again, into these bins of low, intermediate, or high risk, the, this is from the data I just showed you. These are the node-negative patients. Again, low risk do very well. Only a few percent of them recur, um, whereas there are patients where about a quarter of the patients recur in the high-risk group. You can similarly stratify the node-positive patients, although, again, notice that all the numbers are lower. So this is a group that has a worse outcome overall, but even within that group, you can start to stratify better and worse patients. So this is good. This says we can say this patient needs more therapy in some patients. For example, a patient in this group, probably additional therapy is going to, the toxicity will outweigh the benefit. But is there direct data that says that this test actually can pr predict the outcomes of chemotherapy? And again, there are. So what, again, taking advantage of the fact that they could go back to studies that had been collected prospectively, to, and this was a study designed to test whether chemotherapy was beneficial in node-negative hormone receptor positive patients um, beyond tamoxifen. And this is the result of that study, which you can see the blue bar is chemotherapy and tamoxifen, and the yellow bar, uh, the yellow line is um, the results of tamoxifen alone. And, and overall, there was a significant advantage to adding chemotherapy to this group. But you can see that overall, the group does pretty well. And um, there, while it's a statistical significant difference, it's not a huge difference. But when you stratify the patients by recurrence score, what you can and remember about half the patients uh, will have a low risk, you can see that in the low risk patients, they do very well. And there's no additional benefit to adding chemotherapy to these patients. In, uh, in contrast, when you look at the high-risk patients, what you can see is that a much higher percentage of those patients will relapse, somewhere between 30 and 40 percent of those patients relapse by 10 years. And there's a tremendous advantage to giving those patients chemotherapy. So most of this difference is driven by the effects in these patients. There's also an intermediate risk group um, where, at least from this study, you'd say there's no advantage to giving chemotherapy to this group as well. Now, so it's clear that you, from this data, that this group doesn't need chemotherapy, this group benefits. I will say that this group is a gray zone um, at the current time, and the reason for that is twofold. First of all, remember this is a continuous variable. So if this is a continuous variable, it means that patients at this end with a 30 really aren't going to be appreciably different from this 
group that begins at 31, or a patient at the low end of this group with a score of 18 really isn't going to be that different from a patient with 17 in this group. So where to draw the line in this group becomes problematic. And the second problem with this study is it was based on an older study where the chemotherapy certainly wouldn't be considered state of the art or optimal chemotherapy for a, pra for a patient today, so that it's not clear that this group really doesn't benefit or where to draw the line. And there are ongoing studies asking just that question. If you take a group in this intermediate uh, a group of patients in this intermediate category and randomize them to what would be state-of-the-art chemotherapy. Do they benefit from chemotherapy or not? Now, a, a second type of test, so that's a test based on PCR and it's based on and can take advantage of formalin fixed paraffin embedded tissue and that's something that's quite beneficial be, and, and I think the penetrance of that test um, into the clinic is in part because most of our patients, their samples go into formalin and then get fixed, and so, but we can still measure that. But another type of test is using a mi cDNA microarray, and the test that's been approved in this country is known as the mammoprint. S similar to the last test, it was developed to predict risk of relapse in early stage patients, although in this case they were both hormone receptor positive and negative and node positive and negative. And what this relies on is 70 genes um, from a cDNA microarray, which started out by looking at essentially the entire genome, 25,000 genes. Before I go into this test, let's talk a little bit about what a cDNA microarray is, though. So, so microarray technology is a very powerful way of querying the entire, uh, entire set of genes very rapidly. What, what you can do is you can using techniques that are very similar to the techniques used to make microchips in a computer, you can print a known sequence of DNA, an oligonucleotide, onto a chip. So that's just shown here as nine spots on this chip. And so these oligonucleotides could, for example, be an oligonucleotide that would detect each of the genes in your genome. And these chips, the densities of these chips at the current time can hold, I think, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of spots. So you can essentially query the entire genome, which is, 20, which is approximately 25 or 30,000 genes, in one experiment. What you then do is make a probe. In this case, for cDNA microarray, you would isolate RNA from your sample of interest, in this case a breast tumor, label it with a fluorescent probe, and hybridize it to this chip. And if the message is, exists in the pool of messenger RNAs from the, from the sample, it will hybridize and give a signal, and that signal intensity will be proportional to the amount of copies of the gene, uh, of the RNA that are expressed. And then this can be read in a chip reader, which then gives a result that in the raw data looks like that, which isn't particularly interpretable. But that data can then be digitized, and this is an example from the original MAMA print paper. So these are 70 genes across the bottom. It's about 300 patients, so each row represents a patient. Uh, each column represents a gene, and the way the data is presented um, is the intensity of the signal compared to a normalization control shown here in the middle as black is either lower or higher, so low is green and high expression is red. So very simply, it, it's, I guess, a molecular Rorschach test if you look at this. These are the patients that did well and these are the patients that had early relapse. And just looking at this, while it, it's not important to look at any one spot, you can see that there's a pattern that the patients fall into. So for example, the good patients have low expression of these genes and generally high expression of these genes. And the patients who do poorly, it's a little more heterogeneous, but again, higher expression of these genes and lower expression of these genes. But you can take any patient then and simply ask, if we do this microarray and quantify the data, does the patient cluster with this group statistically or with this group? And when they, and when they did that, what they found is that these signatures could predict the outcome. So the patients with a good signature do relatively well, and this is both relapse and overall survival, and the patients with a poor signature uh, do poorly. And since this test was designed to look at both ER positive and negative and node positive and negative patients, in fact, the data hold up for both, in this case I'm showing, node negative patients or node positive patients. But again, the signature predicts the likelihood of relapse of these patients. So this is, again, a very powerful test. It allows us to stratify patients. We know that some patients do well. We know that some patients do poorly. This allows us to start to identify which patients are more likely to be in, in, in those groups and therefore target therapy to the patients shown in red who are more likely to need it. Now, this is actually, I think, used more in Europe where it was developed. It was developed in the Netherlands uh, by a group that's headed by Rene Bernards. And one of the 
one of the problems with this, although I think that's likely to be overcome in the near future, is that this in general needs fresh frozen tissue to do these, or, to do these sorts of microarrays. Um, at, in the current state of the art, that requires um, th that people at the very beginning in the operating room say, okay, this sample has to go not into formalin, but into, in, into a non-fixative solution. In Europe, they're actually managing to do that in studies that are ongoing. I think in this country, it can be done, and it is done in many cases in studies, but I think within the near future, my understanding is they'll be able to do these assays at a formalin fixed tissue as well. So that may not be a, a limiting feature. Now, how do these tests compare to one another? And this was a study published in the New England Journal a few years ago where a group um, compared the recurrence score to this 70 gene profile and to two other tests which used, in this case, f more than 400 genes. And again, all of these tests were developed in slightly different, for slightly different uses. This was developed, as I said, for node negative, hormone receptor positive um, patients. This was developed really for all comer early stage patients. This um, test looked retrospectively at a group of patients. This actually wasn't developed for cancer at all. It was looking um, at what happens to fibroblasts when you induce a wound and the response in fibroblasts to wounding. Um, but it was recognized that many of the signatures you saw in re wound response looked like the signatures you see in cancer cells. The point is that all of these tests identify better patients and, and worse patients in terms of outcome. And when they were compared, it turned out if you took any patient, if it was predicted to be uh, a more likely, uh, a higher likelihood of relapse in this, it, by this test, all of the tests seemed to behave similarly. They all predicted outcome more or, less, more or less equivalently. Interestingly, very little overlap in the genes that were used. There are 25,000 genes in the genome, and yet there's almost no similarity in the genes that were used in these, these tests. What was similar, though, were the processes. They all looked at invasion. They all looked at proliferation. They all looked at things that prevent cell death. So while it's not, it wasn't important what gene was chosen, they all seemed to focus on the same processes. So I'm, I'm going to, so this is where we are today. We're already using genomic measures of, of gene expression in tumors to decide who should and shouldn't get chemotherapy, who needs further treatment, and who doesn't need further treatment. But where, where are we going um, in the near future? So again, treatment will be based on clinical features of the tumor, um, and it continues to be based on that. We continue to use estrogen receptor and HER2, but I think the measures of multiple gene expression are going to become more powerful as we go forward. Um, they're going to allow us to stratify risk. They're, gonna, they're also um, going to start to inform pharmacogenomics, and of course, I'm going to talk a little bit about whole genome sequencing, because I think that's really ultimately where a lot of this is headed. So this is the pro one of the profiles that used 400 genes, and it's probably, um, it's a study done by Sorley et al. Um, from a group that took a number of tumors where the outcomes were known and did a microarray analysis. They focused on 400 genes, which allowed them to stratify the patients into several groups, as seen here in the color code. And what they found was, first of all, so the luminal patients shown here in uh, blue, orange, and, and light blue are all the hormone receptor positive patients, so they cluster together. So the, the, the assay asks, are there genes which associate tumor samples with one another? And it doesn't put in the data that these patients were ER positive or HER2 positive. But in asking, are there genes which can identify subgroups, in fact, what fell out were the ER, the ER positive patients clustered together. The HER2 amplified patients clustered together, shown in, in, I guess, this purple color. And then in the red at the very end, patients we call triple negative breast cancer, can cancers that don't express hormone receptors and don't express HER2 amplification or have HER2 amplification clustered together. So this um, non-supervised clustering identified the subsets we already knew were important. But we gained more information, for, and, and that has prognostic significance as the survival curves show. This is probability of survival in the patients, and you can see that the different groups have different survivals. But it, there's an important distinction here, or important uh, thing that comes out of this study. When we look at ER positive patients, they, all of these patients in these first three groups are ER positive. And yet it's known again that not all ER positive patients respond to hormones, not all ER positive patients do well. And you can see that the group that he's calling luminal A in this study, which are the patients that generally would have high levels of hormone receptor expression, they do very well in, in, in terms of outcome. 
But the patients in these other two groups of hormone receptor positive patients don't do so well. So the power of this is it allows us to, again, look at, and, uh, to look at the patients who have hormone receptor and say, well, not all of them are equivalent. Some of them are going to do well. Some of them aren't going to do well. And really what we need to be focusing our attention on is why don't these patients respond to hormones and do as well as these patients. Um, again, similarly, uh, um, just to make a point, the triple negative patients are known to do poorly. And again, this identified a group of patients that are predominantly the triple negative. He called them basal. Uh, characteristics, we'll come back to that in a second, and they, in fact, have the worst outcome in this graph. This uh, data was generated before the introduction of Herceptin, so the purple line here are the HER2 positive patients before the introduction of Herceptin, so they do very poorly in this group. Currently this group would be somewhere up in this range if, with the introduction of Herceptin. Now what do they mean by luminal and basal? So again, this is um, a definition where the array, the gene expression of luminal cells look like the lumen of the breast duct. So if you looked at the cell that lined the ducts of the breast, they would have a gene expression profile similar to these tumors. If you, the basal cells are the cells that line the outside of a duct in the breast, and they would have a gene expression profile similar to these tumors. Doesn't to be careful, it doesn't mean that these tumors arose from luminal cells. It means they look like luminal cells. The question of where these cells come from and what the source of any of these cancer cells are is still an open question. But they look, at the end of the day, like the cells in the lumen of the breast, and these look like the ones in the basal area of the breast. So focusing on this group for a second, we know this is a group that does poorly. We can't, don't have targeted therapies for them as yet. They're triple negative. They can't use hormones because they don't have hormone receptors. We can't use HER2 because they don't have HER2 amplification. So the question is, can we use array data to start to get better information about these patients? And this is a recently published paper um, from Jennifer Pytenpol's group at Vanderbilt. And the answer is yes. So this is that group of triple negative patients. And you might expect that a group defined by the lack of markers is going to be a heterogeneous group. And, and in fact, it is. She could identify seven subsets. So again, this is just microarray data. And just without worrying about, um, so looking at this data, these are the genes. Each row is a gene. And going across uh, each column is a patient. And it's not important what the genes are, but you can see that they cluster into groups. So for example, the second group has high expression of these genes. Third group has high expression of these genes. And using what looks to be about 1,000 genes or so, you can identify patients um, in, that these patients fall into one of seven different subsets. Now this is all, again, preclinical data, but as, as this data was an analyzed, it became apparent that some pathways were more important in one or another of these. And so what they did is they took cell lines, again, this is preclinical, that represented different subsets of these patients and treated them with different drugs. And in fact, there is differing response to standard chemotherapeutic agents or targeted agents in the different subsets of triple negative of cancers. So while this is all early in development, what it means is, it's certainly in terms of hypothesis generating, is that if a triple negative patient falls into one of these different categories, maybe the therapies that we should be using in these patients should be different. Now, of course, that's a, that's a question that has to be tested clinically, but it, it begins to allow us to ask questions about are there ways to treat these patients more effectively? And again, not, uh, it, it individualizes treatment even further than just saying they're triple negative. It's saying they're triple negative in one of these seven categories. I'm sure this uh, is not likely to be the end of the story and that there are probably going to be other characterizations of, the, of these sorts of patients. But again, it's the power of using multiple genes to dissect um, the molecular phenotype of the tumor. Now, what I want to do now is talk about another topic where I think we're going to impact very uh, profoundly in the foreseeable future, which is pharmacogenomics. And again, as a definition, it's using genetic information, either the sequence of the genes or the expression of those genes, the genotype or phenotype, to predict efficacy or toxicity. And again, I just want to remind you that in a tumor, there are two genomes. There's the tumor genome and the patient genome. So let's focus first on the tumor genome and pharmacogenomics in terms of that. So here, it's the presence of a therapeutic target predicts the treatment benefit. Well, we already know this, but this is, in fact, pharmacogenomics, although it wasn't necessarily thought of in those terms. If a patient has the estrogen receptor, we use hormonal agents. If they have HER2 new amplification, we use HER2-targeted therapies. So 
in, in many respects, the expression of specific genes in the tumors predicts efficacy. And in fact, the absence of these markers predict the lack of efficacy in those tumors of these agents. So this is something that's already being used in the clinic. As a second example, I'm going to go back to something that Larry Brody talked about last month when he discussed the BRCA1 and 2 mutations. So this is a case where these aren't necessarily the targets, but they potentially predict what therapeutic intervention uh, may be beneficial. So if you remember uh, his talk, the BRCA1 and 2 genes, a mar large part of their role in a cell is to, is to help repair DNA damage of a specific type, and those are double-stranded DNA breaks caused by things like ionizing radi radiation or other genotoxic uh, agents. And this is the predominant mechanism those breaks are repaired by in a normal cell, and it depends on having a normal copy of BRCA1 or 2 around. There are other ways to repair this DNA damage, it's just they are less efficient and more likely to cause errors. But in a patient who's, has, who has one defective copy of BRCA1, this pathway still works because all you need is, is a, a copy of BRCA1 or BRCA2 to work. But in the tumor, you've lost both copies. So in the tumor cells from a patient that has BRCA mutation, they have no functional homologous recombination because this pathway uh, has lost two of the, or one or two of the critical components. And so this pathway becomes much more important to the uh, repair of this DNA. And Larry, uh, in, at the end of his talk, showed the results of one study. But the idea is, if you take then a tumor that's dependent on this and interfere with this pathway, the tumor cells should be very susceptible to, to, uh, to any kind of DNA damage, either spontaneous or induced. Whereas normal cells, which ha still have a, a functioning copy of BRCA1 or 2, should actually be relatively spared. And in fact, that's the idea between, uh, behind a new generation of drugs known as PARP inhibitors. PARP is one of the enzymes involved in these alternative repair pathways. If you inhibit this pathway, the tumor cell um, will, will be more sensitive and will die. And in fact, in um, early phase studies where these have been used in BRCA1 or two mutant uh, breast and ovarian cancer patients as a single agent has very high response rates. And so this is actually very promising. And if you think about coupling this with DNA damaging agents, it's, it's likely that this is a, a therapy that will be effective. So why is this pharmacogenomics? It's because the mutations in the tumor are predicting what's likely um, to be effective therapy in these patients. Now, turning to patient pharmacogenomics, and this is a different topic. And again, it's a very broad topic. I, I know people like Doug Figg give a whole lecture on this alone. But the idea is that not only does the genotype of the tumor matter or the phenotype of the tumor, the genotype of, of all of us matter in terms of a response to drugs. And in this case, the presence of genotypic or phenotypic markers in, in any individual patient can predict, again, the drug toxicity or efficacy. Now remember, these are normal, um, all of these are the normal genome. So all of us in this room, if we were to sequence our DNA, would have differences in many different genes. Um, typically, or most commonly, single nucleotide changes in those genes. But before we talk about that, let me just talk about a how this can be used, is already being used in the clinic. So when we think, we don't always think of it in terms of this, but in, in a patient who's being treated with hormonal agents for an ER positive breast cancer, we think about whether the patient is pre- or postmenopausal because the sources of estrogen are different in a pre- and postmenopausal patient. In a premenopausal patient, the predominant source of estrogen is the ovarian uh, hypothalamic pituitary ovarian access. Whereas in a postmenopausal patient, the, the estrogens that are, are produced are produced by converting adrenal androgens to an enzyme known as aromatase into estrogen. So this is pharmacogenomics. In a premenopausal woman, her phenotype is such that um, we can target ovarian estrogens. This is what Beetson did over 100 years ago. He removed the ovaries, and so we can continue to do that, either with oophorectomy or we can use drugs that turn off the ovary. On the other hand, this would do no good, of course, in a postmenopausal woman, and con conversely, in a premenopausal, in a postmenopausal woman, we use enzyme uh, inhibitors of this enzyme, aromatase, to block the production of estrogens by the conversion of adrenal androgens. And again, just as uh, aromatase inhibitors won't work for premenopausal women, um, 
targeting the ovary doesn't work for postmenopausal women. And finally, if we target directly the estrogen receptor, that can be done in, in either pre- or postmenopausal women. But again, this is looking at the patient's phenotype. This has nothing to do with the tumor itself to decide what is the best treatment for this patient. The other more classic way of thinking of uh, pharmacogenomics is metabolic enzymes that may affect it. So for example, the cytochrome P450 enzymes. And again, this is what I was referring to most commonly. These are single point, point changes in the basis. They're not mutations so much as they're a variation between any two people in the population. Um, and these can be measured, so I'm going to come back to a little bit of technology. Just as we did microarrays to look at expression of genes, you can imagine printing a microarray, but now these spots don't re represent probes for individual genes. They could be probes for very single nucleotide polymorphisms in the same gene. So all of these nine spots are probes for the same gene, but shown down below the gene has sequence variations from individual to individual. Again, these are normal people. These are normal genes. But these sequence variations can affect the activity of metabolic enzymes. And again, using these arrays, you can measure Again, hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of these in one, one setting. So if you knew a particular cytochrome that was important, you could just sequence that. But as we go forward, what can be done is an array that will allow us to look at many polymorphisms, and it's conceivable in the future that this will be something done on, on most patients, because it's not just cancer drugs, but drugs for almost any disease we treat will be affected by metabolic enzymes, and you can imagine having a profile and saying, in this patient, we need to be careful with this drug. So the best example I know of this, there, there are no good examples of single nucleotide polymorphisms in breast cancer as yet, but there's a drug called 6 mercaptopurine used uh, predominantly in pediatric tumors, and there are good metabolizers and bad metabolizers of that drug, and if you carry a polymorphism that makes you a bad metabolizer, you're much more likely to have toxicity and the dosing of the drug is affected. And there are a number of drugs where that's true for at this point. So this is something that will affect, again, our decision about what drugs are the best drug for that patient. Um, will there be undue toxicity? In some cases, drugs need to be activated by the metabolic enzymes, and is this a patient where the drug will or won't be activated? And so I'd like to end then with um, what is something that, again, is being done already, but not really in a clinical setting, and that's whole genome sequencing. And this schematic from uh, Greg Friero's uh, recent New England Journal paper that summarizes molecular techniques in genomic medicine talks about the difference between sequencing um, what I guess is traditional sequencing and the next generation sequencing. So this is just a schematic, but in traditional sequencing, you clone a piece of DNA and then you sequence it, and this um, can be done in a reasonable throughput fashion so that you can sequence maybe 100 copies of the gene at a t of a 100 different pieces of DNA at a time, and you get about 100,000 bases of sequence. And it would take probably, if you had a really good person doing this, probably a week or two to do this, and it would take 30,000 experiments like this to sequence the genome once. So th this is, you know, not practical way to sequence the genome. But the current sequencers don't rely on the old methods. They rely on either solid phase or fluid phase methods that sequence not a hundred fragments at a time, but millions of fragments. They do relatively short reads on those fragments, but you generate about 30, mega, uh, 30 gigabases, I'm sorry, a hundred gigabases of data. So if you think about it, the human genome is three billion bases. This is covering the human genome 30 times over in one experiment. And practically speaking, I think this data can be acquired probably in, in a week or less on in, from the time you have a DNA sample to the time you have the data at the end of the day. So this would allow you to acquire the, the sequence on many, many, many genes in the entire genome of the tumor or the patient. Um, what you've probably seen in the literature is the $1,000 genome. The cost of this is rapidly falling to the point where it will cost about $1,000 to do this. We're not at a point where we can use this data. So uh, the analogy Larry Brody actually gave me is a little bit like a CT scan. CT scan is useless without a radiologist to read the, the CT scan and tell you what you're looking at. So this data can be generated very quickly. The problem right now is now you have 100 gigabytes of data or a huge amount of data. It's interpreting that data really that takes a long time. But just to show you some of the things that have been done with it, and again, this is all um, experimental and not clinical, this is from a paper published by Bert Vogelstein's group in Science a few years ago where they took 11 breast cancer and actually 11 colon cancer cell lines and sequenced the entire, all of the coding sequence in that, so the sequence that turns into messenger RNA, not the entire genome. 
what this is a graphical representation they're chromosome 1 through chromosome X so all the human chromosomes are arrayed this way and the little dots and peaks represent mutations seen this is just the breast cancer sample in, in the samples. And everywhere you see a dot, there's, that means there was a mutation in that gene. And if there's a little purple hill, it means there was more than one mutation, more than one sample had a mutation. And what immediately falls out are, are several things. First of all, there are two really high peaks in this. This is P53. So out of the 11 samples, something like seven or eight of them had mutations in P53. So that's nothing that we didn't already know. P53 is one of the most frequently mutated genes in the human genome. This is another gene known as PI3 kinase. It's, a, it's um, a kinase that's involved in lipid metabolism, but it's also very important in signaling in cells, especially towards survival pathways. And again, that's a peak that came out from this data. Um, but there's another thing that comes out of this data. This is 11 samples. This would be the equivalent of sequencing 11 patients. And you can immediately see there's something like 10, 10 or 20 mutations on average per patient. So there are a lot of mutations. And one of the difficulties then in deconvoluting this data is, well, which of these are really meaningful and which of these are noise? So what Bert Vogelstein, which are drivers of the tumor phenotype and which are passengers is, are the terms he's applied to this. But we can hone in on the PI3 kinase example with a little more detail. So out of the 11 samples, this is that peak. It, it, this is showing both the breast and the colon. The blue is the breast. So out of 11 samples, half of them, five of them, had mutations in this particular gene in this protein, and it would turn the protein on, and that would actually drive uh, the proliferation and survival of the cells. But this schematic is the PI3 kinase pathway. And so we really have to think not in terms of genes also, but in terms of pathways um, and in terms of more system type analyses of, of these tumors. Because what the rest of the little circles in blue and red for colon, breast and colon respectively show is that this pathway is targeted in more than, it, more than just hitting this particular protein, so that you see that there are mutations throughout this pathway, and most of them, the net effect is to turn this pathway on. So a lot of the little hills you saw still target this pathway. So actually, if, you, if instead of showing individual genes, you said, well, which of these hills represent this pathway, that would have been a very tall peak. Now, why is this useful information? Again, not um, ready for routine use in the clinic, but it turns out that there are data that support that activation of this pathway make a patient resistant to hormonal therapies or to HER2 targeted therapies. So that means that you might predict these patients won't do as well with Herceptin, for example, or with or tamoxifen or an aromatase inhibitor. And importantly, that these patients may benefit from combinations of therapy that block this pathway and then target the more traditional pathways. So this is very useful information. The problem with the genome data right now is culling the data down to meaningful clinical information. And that's really probably the long part now. Acquiring the data is very rapid. So with that, I'll end with this summary slide. The past was really looking at tumor characteristics and one or, t one or a few genes. We currently are already looking at um, genomic, using genomic medicine. We're looking at arrays that look at anywhere from 20 to 70 genes in breast cancer. But the future really is going to be to expression of hun hundreds of genes um, at a time and, and also sequencing and SNP arrays to, to decide what are the best choices of drugs. Uh, for a given patient, for a given tumor, who needs treatment, who doesn't need treatment. I'll stop there and take questions. <laughs> Go ahead. What happens to the tumor cell that survives chemotherapy? You know, so, so chemotherapy is mutagenic. And so, so people have looked at that. Um, clearly, there. It, it, you know, I, I can't give you a specific example, but clearly, if you look um, at microarray data of, of resistant tumors, it's different. Um, if, if you look at genomic data, there are acquired mutations. There have been data, I, I don't remember if the patient was treated or not, but for example, it, people have done whole genome or exome sequencing on a lobular cancer, both from the original cancer and from metastasis of that cancer. Clearly, there are mutations that are there at the get-go that also show up in the, in the metastatic disease, but there are new mutations in the metastatic disease. And you would imagine that therapy is, whether it, it's going to do two things. Therapy is genotoxic. Most of the chemotherapy we do causes de genetic damage. Radiation is genotoxic. But also we're going to select. It's, it's just like bacterial resistance. We're going to select for pre-existing clones that may not have been detectable that have a mutation. So it's hard to know if the therapy always did it, but it probably causes it. Go ahead. Uh, 
So if you look at the original P10 patients, it's not Can as... Can you repeat the question? Okay. So the question was, what about P10 mutations in breast cancer? And I'm trying to remember if they showed up in this slide. Yeah. So two things. First of all, if you look at the regional paper identifying P10, P10 is a tumor suppressor gene. It's a negative regulator of this same pathway. P10 is down here. Um, it turns off the PI3 kinase pathway. It's a, it's a phosphatase that removes the phosphate that PI3 kinase puts on. These are lipid phosphate, phosphorylation events, not protein. And if you look at the original cloning paper, it actually was found as a progression feature in both glioblastoma but breast cancer. So the original identification of P10 said it would occur in breast cancer, but not that commonly. And, and in Bert Vogelstein's sequence, two out of the 11 samples had P10 mutations. So I think that's certainly likely to be true. These are inactivating mutations. Would, but all of these data say, well, inhibiting this pathway in one shape or form might be a good idea. Obviously, the, the, the genes that are inactivated are hard to think about as targeting because their, their activity is lost. But I think that is going to be something. It's not going to be a common mutation, but really the theme here is not necessarily that P10 is common, but PI3 kinase pathway mutations are probably more common than we know. In this set of tumor cell lines, very biased set, it was half of the cells had a P10, had PI3 kinase mutation. Go ahead. What is the mortality rate of breast cancer at this time as compared to, as compared to say, 1960? What, what is the mortality rate of breast cancer? So, so the, two things. So first of all, the overall mortality rate of breast cancer. So, so one, the way I look at that is, so the question is, what's the mortality rate of breast cancer now compared to 1960? Uh, I have to confess, I'm not really the epidemiologist in the, in the audience, but in general, it's lower now than it was then. If you look, uh, there, has, there was a relatively steady mortality of breast cancer. And one way to look at it very simply is there are about 200,000 cases of breast cancer every year and about 40,000 deaths. So the, so the mortality due to breast cancer is about 20% of all comers. And that, of course, varies based on what your stage at presentation is and so forth and your molecular features. Um, and that was actually very constant. It, it, I don't think it increased over the 60s or 70s. And, and the primary driver of, that mort of, of the rate was that if you detected it early and did surgery, those patients did well. Um, but it didn't change all that much. Starting at about 1990, however, the rate has been decreasing a few percent. So I think that the rate of mortality now is probably two or three percent lower than it was um, in 1990. The, so it's, it's not a dramatic effect, but it's clearly going down. And m the decrease has been um, attributed to two things. One is increased use of screening. And, a, and the other half is the increased use of advanced chemotherapy in more patients. So it's thought to be both the, so both of them targeting early stage patients. To my knowledge, the, tr the mortality for metastatic breast cancer hasn't changed. Essentially, we, there, except for anecdotal data, we don't cure patients who have metastatic breast cancer. So all of the decrease in, in mortality can be attributed to defining it earlier and also treating the early stages more aggressively to deal with micrometastatic disease that's spread. Mammogram, yeah, so, so about half of that decrease is attributed to screening due to mammograms and, and um, I, I guess given the date of onset, it's really not MRI or more advanced screening techniques, but it, it, screening in general has thought to decrease the incidence. The estimate, again, these are epidemiologic estimates. It was a New England Journal article. Uh, Don Berry was, I think, one of the main authors. Um, that estimated that that decrease was, was primarily 50 percent due to screening and about 50 percent due to more aggressive therapy. Um, the other thing that's made a dramatic di difference in the incidence of breast cancer in the last few years, and I think Larry Brody showed this slide, was when the women's um, health study showed that hormone replacement therapy not only didn't decrease heart disease but increased breast cancer, people very rapidly stopped using hormone replacement therapy. And within two or three years, there was a fall in the incidence of breast cancer, which also will drive the fall in the mortality. But really, since 1990, there's been a steady, slow but steady decline. <clears throat> to what extent can this level of scrutiny be used to look at the non-cancerous breast tissue in an effort to predict what So, so the question is um, looking at, I guess, pre or the breast prior to the malignancy, or um, I think there's a lot of work on that. It's clear 
um, from work of people like Mina Bissell that the tumor really uh, arises, it's an organ, and it arises in an environment, and the environment has a major impact. And she's, for example, shown data that you could take tumor cells, and if you put them into one environment, they form a tumor, and if you put them into another environment, the tumor is suppressed. So it's clear that the environment has an impact. Um, it's clear that the genotype has an impact. So if you carry a BRCA1 or 2 mutation, your chances of developing breast cancer over the course of your life are many-fold higher. The average, the, the number that's quoted is roughly one in nine women will develop breast cancer. If you carry a BRCA mutation, the penetrance is anywhere from 40 to 80 percent. So much higher risk. So that's telling you the genotype of the, of the non-malignant cells matters. Um, in terms of what other features matter, we know that there are environmental factors that can increase your risk of breast cancer. There are people who are looking at this. I don't know of any data that I could cite to you that says, okay, this is something that's going to predict someone's risk. But that's something people would like to do. Can you, ideally using a non-invasive method, look at a person's uh, tissue in the breast before they ever develop cancer and predict their risk? People are doing that. They're doing uh, ductal lavage. People are doing biopsies in higher risk patients to see if they can identify markers. I don't think anything's ready for use um, aside from the normal risk factors, BRCA mutation, family history, but those are being looked at. Clearly, they're aggressive. Right, and I, th and I think people are doing that. Um, so people are looking at, at, at the breast. It's, the question is, do you have enough natural history in any given group of biopsies? Do you have samples from patients? So if you've had a breast, the better would be breast reduction surgery where you get samples because then the patient still has a breast. And if they develop breast cancer, you can say these people had breast reduction and uh, didn't develop breast cancer. And that's being done. I, I don't know of any data that says there's something we could really use for that today. But uh, those, those are ongoing studies that I'm sure that are being done in a lot of places. Go ahead. Um, have gene expression microassays been done on men with breast cancer? Good question. So, so my, my, my knee jerk would be I'm sure it's been done. I don't know. I haven't seen any data that specifically look at that. We treat men with breast cancer like we treat women. Um, because we, we don't really have a lot of data to guide us. There are clear data that things like tamoxifen are beneficial. There's a lot of controversy. What about aromatase? Isn't a guy just like a postmenopausal woman? And the answer is, well, we don't know, so we don't know what to do. So that's, that's an interesting question. I, I haven't seen a publication of that sort. I, I can't imagine it's, it's not been done. Uh, obviously, the cases are rare. I, I should say that men with breast cancer, it's, it, depending on how you look at it, it's one it's about 1% of all breast cancer. So since breast cancer is so prevalent, it's not an, uh, it's, it's uncommon, but it's not incredibly rare. I'll just make this the last question, please. Go ahead. Following up on the previous question with the tumor microenvironment, can you comment on how the stroma, which is immediately adjacent to the tumor, how that can be sort of um, marked upon as an expression pattern to understand how the stroma is affecting the tumor? So a lot of pe there's a lot of research going on on just that, and, and it's, uh, I'm sorry, how does the stroma impact the tumor? So first of all, let me just make a point. Most of the expression analysis that's done is done on the tumor, which means tumor cell and stroma, because tumor is an organ. And that was a decision made, for example, the group at Stanford who really started and, and blazed the way on this, Joel Gray's group, they made that decision really out of the practicality. It was easier just to grind up the whole tumor than it is to try to microdissect the tumor from the microarray. And their feeling was you would get information from this. And in fact, you do, because when you look through the data, um, the best example that comes to immediate mind in lymphoma, there is prognostic information that comes from looking at the whole tumor. But some of the prognostic information is an immune signature of the response to the tumor and not the tumor cells themselves. So, and that's true in breast as well. So you're getting information. But people are microdissecting. They're looking at stroma versus normal. There are clearly data that suggest the stroma is, not, is different in tumors. Um, there are data that go back a long time, probably 10 or 15 years, that in prostate cancer, if you take fibroblasts from uh, patients with prostate cancer versus patients without, they support the growth of prostate cancer cells very differently. The, the normal don't and the tumor fibroblasts do. So people are looking at that because that becomes another target. 
And the, intri the intriguing part of that is the normal cells, their, ge their genomes are more stable. So if you start to target the normal cells, maybe you won't have as much problem with development of resistance that you do in the tumors. But that's an active area of research. There are a lot of people looking at the stroma.